Okay, uh, welcome to our um, first uh, IMSC graduate seminar, if you don't count the first one. Uh, today we have a uh, my great pleasure to uh, invite Dr. Bahi Benzendan to come back. Uh, he just recently graduated, right? That's correct. And Last you were, year. Uh, in the uh, New Haven. I'm now an assistant professor at the University of New Haven. Yes. Okay. I'm so excited about your talk. Uh, deep, deep reinforcement learning techniques for uh, evaluation of robustness and resiliency in complex systems. Okay. So we have a very short period of time. Um, so the seminar lasts about 50 minutes. Uh, you can just uh, leave about 10 minutes for uh, Q&A and that'd be great. Certainly. And okay. if you could make me co-host uh, so that I can share my screen. Actually, can you share my screen now? You could, actually. Let's see. Yes. I think we're all set. Yeah, we're all set. And here we go. So, Thank you very much, Dr. Chang, for inviting me. And it's great to see a lot of familiar names and a lot of new colleagues working on interesting problems during their graduate studies at K-State. I slightly changed the title of my talk. So now we're going to talk about the butterfly effect in the wind tunnel, a deep reinforcement learning approach. Just a quick mandatory marketing slide. I want to talk about our lab at the University of New Haven. I'm the director of the Secure and Assured Intelligent Learning Lab, where we work on multiple directions of research, including the security of artificial intelligence, which involves either finding or mitigating attacks against self-driving cars, autonomous drones, machine learning models applied in critical infrastructure, and so on. We also work on human compatible AI. In other words, making sure that terminators never become a thing. And our other directions are mostly on machine learning and in general artificial intelligence for cybersecurity, national security, and societal good, for example, precision agriculture and epidemic control. So here's a general outline of today's talk. I'm here to uh, talk about a solution. But before that, I need to make sure that we are all on the same page with regards to the problem. So we are going to start by quickly going over the problem statement and settings. And we'll talk about the framework to think about the problem, then We'll briefly review or, uh, or uh, summarize the basics of reinforcement learning as an approach to the problem, as a solution concept for the problem. And we'll build on it to talk about deep reinforcement learning. And we'll build on all of this to talk about how we can use deep reinforcement learning to benchmark the resilience and robustness of complex adaptive systems. And we'll end the talk with a brief summary of directions of research. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem in general is sequential decision making. Many of you have already encountered this in your academic work, but I'm quite sure that all of you grapple with this particular problem on a second to second basis. What does this problem mean? What does it refer to? Well, the goal is to find the optimal or an optimal way to make decisions. However, these decisions can impact things much later in time. Examples of these decisions include saving for retirement, choosing which courses to take, managing an investment portfolio, controlling a power station or a smart grid, walking uh, or making a robot walk from point A to point B. Uh, and if we generalize this, autonomous navigation, driverless cars, and uh, the problem of uh, 
taking the best instantaneous actions that maximize the long-term uh, reward or long-term utility of the driving uh, process. And of course, another more relevant example to IMSC is inventory management and inventory control. So there are two types of approaches to sequential decision-making. Uh, one is called planning, which as the name suggests, typically happens before execution. So in planning, an agent, which can be a human decision maker or an artificial agent, simulates the consequences of different actions and then either through search or reasoning, figures out the best plan, in other words, best sequence of actions to optimize the, uh, the solution to the goal. This is similar to the artillery problem. In artillery, uh, what, the, uh, what the handlers of the weapon do is they decide on the angle, the thrust, and a few other parameters before they shoot the rocket, before the rocket is set off. But once it's been deployed, once it's been fired, there is no more control over it. Everything has been pre-planned. On the other hand, we have the control solution, which, which essentially incurs or occurs during the execution. The way it works is there is some sort of agent or a decision model that decides how to react to changes in the environment. Um, an example of this is heat-seeking anti-aircraft, anti-air missiles, which modify their trajectory over time based on their thermal sensor inputs or visual sensor inputs. Now, the problem is further complicated if we consider uncertainty. Remember, I mentioned that in planning, the agent requires a model to reason about or predict what the consequences of different actions are, how different actions uh, impact the evolution of the system, the dynamics of the system. However, uh, those models are not always available. And even when they are available, models are by definition abstractions of the real world. This is one of my favorite graphics uh, in the entire domain. What do you see here is we have the real Earth, a picture of the real Earth, and any model that we make is an abstraction of the real thing. It's abstracting away some details, some pieces of information. There's a very famous quote by a statistician uh, by the name of Box, which says, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So that wrongness of models comes from uh, the uh, abstraction, uh, the abstractive nature of the modeling process. So we often have to deal with incomplete models. Also, the environment can be noisy. This, uh, from one point of view, can be seen as another instance of having an incomplete model, of course. Noise is something that has not been uh, fully accounted for in the model. The actions of the agent may be noisy. So the agent may decide to go forward if we are assuming a navigating robot, for example. But for some reason, the move forward action doesn't always occur. There may be some sort of obstacle in front of the wheel or the legs of the agent preventing it from moving forward. And in many cases, there is no, uh, no useful model available it's very expensive to create a useful model, particularly in complex real world circumstances. It's difficult to come up with 
a, an accurate model of the environment dynamics. So how do we approach this sort of problem? How can we think about this sort of problem? Well, as it happens, a relatively old uh, framework can be very well applied to capturing the essence of this type of sequential decision-making process. And it's called the Markov decision process or the MDP framework. It, an MDP is defined by a set of states, a set of all possible states in the environment, a set of actions, a set of permissible actions, either per state or in general, the set of actions that the agent can perform in the environment, a transition function, which is uh, the other word or phrase for the dynamics or the model for the environment, which tells us the probability that uh, the probability of ending up in a state S prime if we are in state S and perform action A. The other component of an MDP is a reward function. A reward function is a scalar, is a number that tells the agent how well the instantaneous action A in a state S resulting in a transition to a state S prime has been. You can think of it as, uh, let's say, the treat you give uh, to your pet when it does something that you approve of. When you're training it to do a trick or something, you give it a treat. You can think of rewards as an analog of those treats. Um, also, an MDP must include a start state, where do we begin from, and maybe a terminal state. Why maybe? Well, many of the problems, many of the sequential decision-making problems that we have to deal with in the real world don't have a terminal state. They have to run for as long as uh, humanly possible or worldly possible. Those are called infinite horizon decision pro uh, processes. Now, we can think of MDPs as non-deterministic search problems. So for those of you who are familiar with search algorithms like breadth-first search, depth-first search, A star and such, those algorithms are typically used for planning or replanning. MDPs are considered search problems of a non-deterministic nature. There is some stochasticity, some uncertainty involved in the problem setting. Now, remember the M in MDP stands for Markov. What's Markov about MDPs? This is probably a reminder for many of you. Markov generally means that given the present state, the future and past are independent. In other words, to understand, to reason about the future state, we only need to know the current state. We don't care about the history of uh, the state space or the trajectory. Everything that we need to need for making an accurate prediction of the next state is available in the representation of the current state. So more mathematically, you can think of this as the probability of the next state uh, is only dependent on the, pro on the current state and the action that we take at the current state. This is just like search, where the successor function could only depend on the current state or not the, his uh, not the history of the search trajectory. This is probably worthy of a few seconds of thought, maybe during the talk, maybe afterwards. You might want to think about whether the Markovian assumption is applicable to real-world problems. This is a longer discussion. If we have time, we'll come back to it towards the end of the talk. But uh, 
it's definitely worth your thinking about this. How can we, how can we assert that the Markovian assumption is uh, applicable to real world sequential decision making? Now let's define another concept called policy. In planning problems or in deterministic search problems, what we are after is an optimal plan. And a plan is essentially a sequence of actions that take the agent from start to a goal. However, in MDPs, instead of a plan, we are looking for an optimal policy, typically represented by pi star, which is a mapping between the states to actions. A policy pi uh, receives the state as its argument and tells us what action we should perform in that state. Of course, the policy can be both deterministic and stochastic. If it's deterministic, then the policy is a function. If it's a stochastic, if it's non-deterministic, you can think of it as a distribution. An optimal policy is one that maximizes expected utility if it's followed by the agent. Now, it's interesting to note that an explicit policy, when we have the policy, it defines a reflex agent. What's a reflex agent? It's an agent that reacts to the immediate state. Uh, you can think about human reflexes. When a bug flies towards your eyes, you automatically and reflexively close your eyes, right? That's a reflex. And a policy, in essence, defines, defines a reflex agent. That doesn't mean that the policy is still not optimizing for longer term uh, sum of rewards or longer term utility. The policy can still be uh, optimizing for long term utilities and yet act as a reflex agent. Now, to work towards a solution, we have to define two more concepts. These are metrics, these are measures of how well uh, a particular policy or a particular plan or a particular action is. The first of which is a value function. The value function at state S tells us how good that particular state is with regards to our objective or our utility function. And it's defined as the expected cumulative reward from following the policy pi starting at state S. Now there are a couple of uh, new notations here. One is gamma. Gamma here is a discount factor. A discount factor plays a relatively important role here and it's that of discounting the uh, value or the utility of rewards that occur further down the road, later in time. So just as a quick example in the, the domain of decision theory, if I give you the choice between $1 million today and $1 million tomorrow, many of you are going to choose to get the $1 million today. Why? Because you're not sure about things that happen further down the time. You prefer to get things now rather than later. And this discount factor is a value between zero and one that essentially discounts or uh, downplays the value of things that happen further down the line. Also, why do we uh, use the expectation operator here. It's because we are not always certain about how things unfold over time in the future. We do have some samples. We do have some knowledge of how things have worked before, but uh, because of the stochasticity, because of the non-deterministic nature of MDPs, we are not completely certain of things that happen in the future. So we go with a weighted approach weighted average approach to account for this non-deterministicity. Uh, Another concept that we're going to introduce is the Q value function, which tells us how good is 
uh, performing an action, a certain action A, in a state S. How do we formally define it? It's the expected cumulative reward from taking action A in state S and then following the policy pi. And it's defined similarly as above, but now we are assuming that at state S, we are not necessarily following policy pi. We are performing a particular action A and from the next state onward, you're following the policy pi. Now, the solution. A solution to the MDP problem or the MDP settings is reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, we consider uh, the typical sensor and motor environment or uh, problem settings where we have an agent who observes the state of the environment and accordingly performs an action that changes the state of the, uh, state of the environment. That change is observed by the agent along with a reward function generated by the environment telling the agent how well it is done. What's the basic idea? Well, receive feedback in the form of rewards and the agent utility is defined by the reward function. What must be done, it must learn to act so as to maximize uh, expected rewards over time. And the key in reinforcement learning is that all learning is based on observed samples of outcomes. Now that we've started, we've opened the uh, can of worms and we've used the term learning, it may be helpful to quickly take a look at where reinforcement learning stands with regards to other types of machine learning. So the classical categorization of machine learning approaches is as illustrated here. There's supervised learning where the idea is to find uh, a best fit function between input samples and outputs. It's essentially function fitting. And to fit that function, we do have access to labeled data. We know what the input is and we know what the correct output is. We know, uh, for example, in image recognition, uh, we have the image itself in the training data and the correct caption of that image. Then there is unsupervised learning where the data does not come with labels and there is no feedback coming from anywhere. The idea in unsupervised learning is to find underlying structures and patterns in data. An example of unsupervised learning is clustering. Some of you may be familiar with k-means clustering and such. But reinforcement learning is fundamentally different from these two. Why? Because it involves an agent that actually changes, performs something that affects the environment, affects the data, and it's solving a decision process. It's not an instantaneous recognition or mapping, but it's solving a sequential decision problem. So here's a general taxonomy of reinforcement learning. Um, uh, we have those that directly optimize or learn the value function and then extract the policy from it. And by value function, I mean the Q function uh, or the state value function. There are those that explicitly and directly learn the policy. These are called policy-based functions. There are different types of categorization with regards to the uh, role of model in learning. If the agent explicitly learns a model of the dynamics first and then derives the optimal policy from it, the approach is called model-based. But if it does not explicitly learn a model, so learning the model is not part of the uh, 
learning process, we call that uh, we call uh, that kind of approach model free. And uh, between value function, value based reinforcement learning, and policy based reinforcement learning, there is a a very interesting class of reinforcement learning algorithms where there is a value based learner and a policy based learner which try to criticize each other and in an adversarial manner enhance or improve the training uh, uh, over time. Now, let's quickly look at one example of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms uh, based on Q value iteration. So, the term value iteration means finding successive depth limited values. We start with uh, an initial value uh, assignment to each state. We can start with assigning the value zero to every state. Then for each new iteration, we calculated the depth K plus one values for all states. How? The new value of a state is the max over action of the value of the previous state plus uh, the current value of that state plus the value of the upcoming state. This is essentially very similar to bootstrapping. There are things going on in chat. Let me quickly monitor what's going on. Um, David has a question about uh, what do we mean by noisy environment? Uh, well, no, not necessarily. Noisy means there, there are unexpected observations. Observations don't always precisely match the predictions of our model. Um, okay, I hope that answers the question. We can come back to it at the end of the talk. Now, let's talk about best Q values. Best Q values are more useful. Why? Because they essentially tell us what action to perform. So instead of uh, finding a good value for the state and then iterating over actions to find which action gives us the value that we found for that state, we can directly solve the problem by uh, finding the Q values for state action pairs. This is a slightly more computationally efficient. We start with assigning an initial value uh, to each state action pair. It can be zero, it can be something else. And then through each iteration, we perform the same iterative update. This may seem very familiar to many of you. This is, in essence, the Bellman formulation of dynamic programming. And yes, what I'm talking about here is dynamic programming. But we will take it to uh, a slightly higher level in just a couple of slides. Now, based on... Uh, Q iteration, Q value iteration, we define Q learning, which is sample-based Q value iteration. We, at each iteration of Q value iteration, take uh, look at the look at a new sample of what we call the SARSA tuple, being in a state S, performing an action A, getting a reward R, and ending up in the state S prime. We look at those samples, and for each sample, we update the corresponding estimate of the Q value for state and action, according to the same formulation. Essentially, we are learning Q values as we go. Um, so we receive a sample, S A S prime R, we can call this an experience as well. We consider our old estimate of Q S and A. 
then we uh, consider your new sample estimate and incorporate the new estimate into the running average. This should look familiar to many of you who are familiar with dynamic programming and approximate dynamic programming. This is essentially the same settings as uh, sample-based dynamic programming, but we are applying it to sequential decision-making in a data-driven or sample-based setting. Now, the policy, the value function and model are all functions or distributions. We want to learn at least one of these from experience, from data. If there are too many states, however, if, we, if the state space is really large or if the action space is also very large, it's not going to be possible to tabulate all of the values of uh, all of the Q values for states and actions, right? In these circumstances, what we can do is to approximate. In general, this is called RL with function approximation, reinforcement learning with function approximation. So instead of explicitly tabulating every value, uh, exploring and expanding every value for every state and every action, what we do is we sample and we approximate the Q function based on our samples. When this approximation is performed using neural networks or deep neural networks, we call, uh, we call it deep reinforcement learning. It's a relatively new term. It was introduced in late 2013, early 2014 by Nee and David Silver and their colleagues at DeepMind. But the concept is actually very old. The first instances of applying neural networks to solving the reinforcement learning, the approximation problem in reinforcement learning go back to early 90s or even late 80s. Now, why did deep reinforcement learning suddenly become so uh, attractive? Why is there so much hype around it in the machine learning community and a lot of other communities, including operations research? It's because the base proposals, the more recent proposals of applying neural networks to the approximate dynamic programming or reinforcement learning settings solve a number of what we previously thought to be fundamental problems. One is feature engineering. So, when you want to represent a state and when you want to feed the state into the model, typically and classically what a machine learning engineer did was they designed a feature vector, a numerical feature vector, which was an encoded abstraction of the state. Now coming up with good, accurate, encoding of states as vectors, as input vectors, is really difficult for large state spaces and large environments. Also, um, uh, another issue is uh, when the feature spaces, when the state space or the feature vector is too large, it becomes, it used to be thought that it becomes computationally infeasible to apply those for real time, real world applications. Now, combining deep learning with reinforcement learning solves both problems at the same time. Deep learning is very well known for its ability to learn feature representations automatically on its own. You can pass pixel values as a two-dimensional matrix to a convolutional neural network, and it automatically learns a suitable representation that, uh, that can be used for uh, classification or function approximation or other tasks. So the feature engineering is now eliminated from the pipeline. 
And also deep neural networks have been shown to be very, very applicable and feasible for high dimensional input vectors. So now the problem of uh, dimensionality is also to some extent eliminated. At least it's been the complexity of the problem has been reduced. The other problem with using neural networks in reinforcement learning is the non-IID-ness of data. For those of you who come from a statistics background, who've taken a statistics and a statistical modeling course, you, should, you are already familiar with the term IID. It stands for independent and identically distributed. Now, the, uh, the IID-ness of data is a fundamental assumption in many of our machine learning approaches, including classical classification problems and uh, supervised learning problems. However, in reinforcement learning, the data are particularly non-IID. What we see next, the next state, is very much correlated to the previous state. And states are not necessarily identically distributed in the data set or in the uh, experience set. The proposal that came out uh, in 2013 from DeepMind was to use an experience replay, essentially a bag where we store all of, where we put every experience in, in no particular order. And at training time, we go in, sample a batch randomly, and we train on that random batch. The idea here is this random uh, sampling of the batch reduces the correlation uh, between the dependence between the samples. And another idea is the more we explore, the more we experience the environment, the more identically distributed the data set or the experience set becomes. So this was another important uh, novel contribution of uh, the work by DeepMind. Also, there are two other more technical contributions. Uh, one is very simple, normalizing rewards to the range of minus one to one to make sure that the uh, approximated rewards over time are bounded. And also they fix, uh, they propose to use a fixed target network, target of optimization or target of learning uh, to reduce oscillations over training. All of these together applied to Q learning gave rise or comprised uh, the architecture called deep Q networks or DQMs. All right, so how well do these networks or these DQN agents perform? Here are a few demos. The common benchmarks for deep reinforcement learning algorithms are Atari games. Many of you probably don't remember Atari and Atari games. These are uh, very, very crude, yet still graphical games, uh, uh, single player games. Now, if we drop a DQN agent into the Pong environment without giving it any knowledge about the rules of the game, after about 100,000 iterations of training, let me go back. This is what we observe. And it's probably obvious that the green uh, player is our DQN agent. You see that it leaves absolutely no room for the human player to even win a single hand. This is when we train the DQN agent in Enduro, a car racing game, and you can see it's performing very, very well compared to how typical human players, uh, even expert human players perform in this game. Here's another example, Beam Riders and Qbert. It's again, important to emphasize on this fact. These agents start their training with absolutely no knowledge of the rules of the game or the dynamics of the environment. They explore different options. They randomly explore different uh, possibilities and different 
trajectories until they learn a policy that satisfies the uh, objective. The objective in all of these games is to maximize the game score. Here's another example. The face we are looking at here is that of Lisa Dahl, the world champion of the game of Go, after losing three hands to AlphaGo. AlphaGo is the deep reinforcement learning agent based on both Q learning and a depth limited search that managed to win against the best human player in the very complex game of Go. This, was, this is considered as a holy cow moment for many of us because we didn't expect this to happen so soon. A lot of us uh, predicted uh, this game to be solved a lot later in time, maybe 2030, 2040, but it was uh, essentially solved in 2014, 2015. Now, so what? What can we do with this? How does this relate to the type of problems that we deal with? DeepRL can handle high dimensional state spaces. So it, has, it can so far be applied to real world applications. It can handle complex dynamics. There's no need for manual modeling or engineering of models and can learn generalizable policies. So once a deep uh, RL agent is trained, in theory, it should be uh, applicable to everywhere else as well. But uh, this is not completely accurate. We'll come back to this in a moment. Now, one application area of deep reinforcement learning is a domain of complex adaptive systems. So what are complex adaptive systems? They are systems like your brain, power, uh, the power grid, the immune system, or social networks, the social systems, which are comprised of a large number of constitu constituent elements and interactions. If you want to study their dynamics, you can't just break them down and look at individual elements and then figure out what the global pattern is like. Their dynamics is nonlinear. There's some form of hierarchical structure. And these two are my favorite properties of CAS. There's emergent behavior from local interactions emerges a global pattern, such as self-organization. And here's an example of self-organization. You've probably seen such patterns of birds flocking around uh, Kansas. There's no general super user, a God, super controller uh, shaping this pattern. This pattern is shaped from each bird following a simple rule maintain a certain distance from the bird in front of you and the bird to, the, to your right and the bird to your left. And this is an example of emergent self-organization. Now, there are a lot of examples of CAS in, uh, in our domain. One such example is smart cities. Smart cities are essentially mainly decentralized and adaptive. They comprise a large number of constituent elements and interactions, including uh, traffic management system, uh, emergency management system. The dynamics are nonlinear. There's some form of hierarchical structure, and there is a lot of emergent self-organization. And there are different modeling approaches to CAS. You're probably familiar with those. In the interest of time, I know that you, since a lot of you are familiar with this particular slide, I'm going to skip over this. One remaining problem, one open, uh, open uh, problem in CAS is measuring the vulnerability and resilience of CAS to both intentional and unintentional perturbation. So the problem is benchmarking the resilience and robustness of CAS. What do I mean by those? Well, to think about these problems, uh, back in 2017, 2018, I, along with my co-authors, defined two metrics here, adversarial resilience and adversarial robustness of CAS. Resilience refers to the inverse of the minimum cost incurred to an adversary who's intentionally trying to perturb the system to impose the maximum achievable damage to the target. And it's assumed to be uh, in the zero to one range we can normalize it to the zero to one range. 
And we also define adversarial robustness of CAS to an adversarial action as the minimum cost incurred to the adversary to impose any unacceptable damage to the target. Why do we talk about adversaries here? Well, if we can see what the worst case scenario is, we can probably come up with a lower bound or an upper bound to what can happen uh, through unintentional perturbations or non-adversarial perturbations. Now, we create a threat model based on different types of attacks. There can be passive attacks where uh, the adversary only observes the environment to infer something about the structure or the dynamics of the CAS, and there are active attacks which involve the external exertion of perturbations to achieve an adversarial objective. Now we can classify attacks based on the CIA triangle, which is very well known in cybersecurity. C in CIA refers to confidentiality, which means uh, the breach of confidentiality or gaining access to unauthorized information. Uh, I is integrity, which corresponds to perturbing the accurate functioning of the system and availability is disrupting the operation of the system. And to address this problem of measuring or benchmarking the resilience and robustness of CAS, we proposed a deep reinforcement learning approach using deep reinforcement learning as an adversary to measure how bad things can get in different CAS. We performed three case studies. One was cascade failure in power grid. So we simulated a power grid with 24 buses, 10 generators, uh, 38 transmission lines, and 32 generating units. And then we trained a DQN agent. And uh, we showed that the DQN agent with different levels of budget or uh, uh, a DQN agent who cuts uh, or eliminates different nodes in this power distribution network can achieve a vulnerability or a robustness score of 34% in this environment. Another example is disruption of traffic flow in intelligent traffic management systems. The idea is to tamper with the internal schedules of fixed time traffic signals by perturbing the traffic sensors such that the total travel time in the transportation network is dramatically increased. Now, the attacker can compromise at most B sensors at any given time. That's the budget of the attacker and also the action space of the attacker. And we threw in a, a traffic flow simulation performed in the SUMO environment, the SUMO traffic simulator, with five major intersections as target sensors. We show that our results match a heuristic algorithm for measuring uh, uh, vulnerability and robustness in traffic flow. Uh, it matches it uh, exactly, and we show that our algorithm performs at least as well as the state of the art in this domain. And finally, in the domain of social networks and social systems, in a 2017 paper, I, along with my co-authors at the University of Nevada in Reno, showed that we can apply the same framework to simulate and come up with a disruption policy or a targeting policy that optimizes the, that essentially pushes a terrorist network towards uh, collapse or, the, uh, or fragmentation. This is based on game theoretic agent-based modeling of agents. The, the reward of the reward or the payoff function of those agents are learned through the uh, Q learning process based on uh, observed data. And we show that our proposed framework performs much better than non-classified or unclassified metrics used by the DOD in designing their strategic uh, high value targeting operations. Now, here's my final slide. What are some of the frontiers in this domain if you're interested in learning more 
about this area or doing research in this area, the main problem that almost uh, all of the research groups and research efforts in this area are focusing on is reducing the cost of training. Deep reinforcement learning is a lot more computa computationally intensive than uh, typical supervised learning or unsupervised learning. That Pong agent, the agent that learned to play the game of Pong, took about 12 hours for me to train on an NVIDIA GPU, and that was a relatively simple environment. So there's a lot of effort being put in uh, to find better exploration strategies, better, uh, better collection of experiences, better approximation mechanisms, which can also be more robust and also better guided, such as Bayesian approaches, better model architectures with sufficient complexity to handle uh, the environment they are trying to model or interact with, and better simulations. This is very important. Almost everything we've talked about so far is dependent on the availability of a good simulation environment. Also, another thing that my lab is currently working on is the importance of delay discounting. Currently, discounting is done by fixing the discounting rate, treating it as a constant, which is not representative of how we, as natural instances of intelligence, perform delayed discounting. We use experience, we use a lot of other factors, and we are trying to bring those into deep RL as well. Now, security of RL itself, the robustness and resilience of RL algorithms themselves was the topic of my PhD dissertation. Uh, and uh, it's something that my lab is still working on. Uh, it's important to note that as DRL is uh, more and more widely adopted in critical infrastructure, we need to make sure that these agents are reliable. And finally, multi-agent settings. Multi-agent reinforcement learning has become uh, very, very popular in the research community in the past year or so. And some of the approaches to optimizing multi-agent learning are based on uh, ideas like potential field game theory, uh, mean field game theory, and evolutionary game theory, as well as psychological and neuroscientific approaches. Uh, surprisingly, I'm only two minutes over time. This is, uh, well, beyond my expectations. Thank you so much for bearing with me. If we have time, Dr. Chang, I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, maybe you have time for a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, before we get to that, 